Hello and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program tonight. My name is Isabel Rosenthal, and I'm the Public Programs Associate at the Skirball Cultural Center. We are a museum and cultural center in Los Angeles, deeply rooted to the Jewish values to welcome the stranger, to build community, and to welcome community in all of its incredible diversity, especially here in Los Angeles. As an institution, we are committed to the pursuit of justice and to honor memory. Tonight, we are here to discuss USC professor and author George Sanchez's new book, Boyle Heights, How a Los Angeles Neighborhood Became the Future of American Democracy. With that, I have the honor of introducing our two guests, starting with Professor George Sanchez, who is not only a professor of American studies and ethnicity, and history at USC, but also an award-winning scholar of Amer Mexican American history and immigration. Additionally at USC, Professor Sanchez, of diversity and democracy, as well as the president of the Organization of American Historians. Professor Sanchez received the first ever equity award for excellence in recruiting and retaining underrepresented populations in the historical profession from the American Historical Association. Alongside Professor Sanchez, we have author and scholar of California history, David Kippen, who currently teaches writing full-time at UCLA and who is the former literature director of the National Endowment of the Arts and whose own books include Dear Los Angeles, The City and Diaries and Letters, 1542 to 2018, and soon to be published, Dear California. David is a longtime resident of Boyle Heights, and he founded the nonprofit bilingual storefront lending library, Libras Schmibros, in Boyle Heights, which is now celebrating its 10th anniversary. David is a longtime contributor to the New York Times and to the Los Angeles Times, and is a frequent contributor to public radio. And without any further ado, I'll pass it over to you, George and David, so we can hear more about this incredible chronicle of the dynamic neighborhood of Boyle Heights. Take it away. Thank you very much, Isabel. And thank you all in your hundreds for coming. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Sanchez. Um, it's an honor to be interviewing you. Um, I will jump right in. Um, Please do. Uh, so um, tell us about your personal history uh, with Boyle Heights. You spent uh, plenty of time there in childhood. Where did you live? Uh, Parent, my parents moved uh, to Boyle Heights as immigrants from Mexico in 1957. And then uh, they, they lived in a rented house on City View, north of what was then uh, Brooklyn, now Avenida Cesar Chavez. Um, I was born in 1959 at White Memorial and uh, lived there uh, for the first five years of my life, uh, at which point, my father got a job in Gardena and we moved to South LA. Um, and so lived in various places in Los Angeles County and uh, went off to college, graduate school, and then returned to Los Angeles, uh, teaching at, first at UCLA, a uh, little interlude in Michigan, and then uh, back to USC. So have been basically, uh, you know, hanging around Boyle Heights for a very long time, uh, the last 23 years affiliated with USC. I'm curious, um, your old house on City View, um, is it still standing? Is it occupied? It's still standing. Uh, it, uh, I think right now I've been by and it seems to have uh, Latino residents is not uncommon on City View. Uh, the best that I can figure out when my parents uh, first moved there, they rented from a Jewish family uh, that had moved out of, uh, of Boyle Heights and had moved, but had kept that house. And I know that their first ever dining room table, which we stayed, you know, stayed at our dining room table for a very long time, white for mica, uh, came from that, that family. We were, they, it was gifted over to us. So uh, I have very fond memories of, uh, uh, that stayed with with the family as we moved around Los Angeles. I bet you could still smell the Kreplach for years. Absolutely. <laughs> um, 
I'm I'm curious. Uh, so when did it occur to you that Boyle Heights would not just be um, a, a, fond, a fondly remembered home neighborhood, but the subject for historical study? Um, I uh, had been trained in Mexican American history, and um, my first book, Becoming Mexican American, traces uh, migration from Mexico to Los Angeles in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, it broadly covered all of East Los Angeles. And um, having been trained in Mexican American history and Mexican migration history, um, I found myself constantly running into other groups in East Los Angeles, essentially in the research. Um, and I would say, well, that's great, but that's not my subject. And I'd set that aside. That's great, it's not my subject, but I'd set that aside. And I did that so consistently that I realized there was something going on that I needed to return to uh, in East Los Angeles, particularly in Boyle Heights. Uh, the, my book came out in 1993, and uh, this was in the wake of the 1992 Los Angeles riots, where basically people were asking, you know, uh, can people get along in communities that are diverse? You know, can we all get along? Um, and, and that was being asked of South Central Los Angeles, but I kept returning to Boyle Heights, knowing that this was a community in which multiple groups had lived together uh, rather successfully, rather peacefully for a very long time. So um, those two things sort of came together uh, and I decided to return to Boyle Heights, but really with the, with the lens of trying to do a multiracial history, which had typically not been done uh, for many communities in the United States. So there wasn't exactly a model of doing this. And I wanted to, to uh, do it very richly uh, and uh, richly with each of the groups that were there. So spent a lot of time both learning uh, parts of Jewish American history, Japanese American history, and knew some of African American history, but bringing those together in a new and innovative way to, to really be able to discuss Boyle Heights in depth. You mentioned that this sort of multiracial history hadn't really been done for other parts of the country. What other parts of the country resemble Boyle Heights in their multiracial history? How unique is it? Um, well, as I've talked to people from other places, um, they will sometimes remember moments in the history of Brooklyn, let's say, in New York, that certainly multiracial at different times. Uh, some will go back to Chicago, kind of the place, uh, the, the starting place of so much ethnic histories. And realize that when you when you kind of look at, at all the ethnic histories of Chicago, they were often occurring very near each other. Mm -hmm. So that there might have been a couple of blocks that were heavily Polish, but that sort of then went a couple of blocks that were very mixed, and then another a community of Italians, and then another mixed and a group of Mexicans. So um, it just depends on how you're describing urban communities. You can focus on those communities that are heavily of one group or you can focus on the blocks, sometimes the whole neighborhoods, which are actually mixed. And I realized that US historians had a tendency to focus on, on the, the single ethnic group in a neighborhood, creating a neighborhood, uh, being that neighborhood. And then as that neighborhood shifted and changed, it might've changed over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, but that was always called change to something else. Mm -hmm. when it became single ethnic again of some other group. So I was very interested in, in trying to trace that, that moment that people talked about as change as something that actually is very, is much more commonplace in US urban history than is given credit for and trying to understand what that is about. And of course you mentioned Brooklyn, which, uh, which is named after Brooklyn Avenue in Boyle Heights, which is now, uh, Cesar Chavez, or, or perhaps vice versa. Um, you mentioned East, East Los Angeles, the subject of your first book. Um, people, I think, can be excused for being a little shaky with their geography. Would you distinguish for us um, uh, the difference, uh, either geographically or, I suppose, in a larger sense, between Boyle Heights and East Los Angeles and the East Side and other terms people throw around? Sure. Um, let me let me start with Boyle Heights. Boyle Heights, basically, you reach by heading east from downtown Los Angeles, passing the Arts District and hitting the LA River. 
When you cross that, you're then in the flats area of Boyle Heights, but you're in Boyle Heights, you're still in the city of Los Angeles. So that's a critical distinction. And if you keep going east, when you hit Indiana Street, you've exited the, the city of Los Angeles, moved into the county. So in the county of Los Angeles is the formal East Los Angeles, which is unincorporated LA County. So there's one way of thinking of East LA, which is just that unincorporated area. But most people think of everything east of downtown as East Los Angeles. So that would include parts of the city, parts of the county. To the north is Lincoln Heights, which uh, deserves its own history. It was heavily Italian uh, and Mexican for a very long time. Uh, to the south is Vernon, which is a very different kind of configuration, a separate uh, city actually, with very few residents and a lot of industry. So um, the freeways have changed some of that geography a bit. Uh, the five freeway to the south, the, the 10 freeway to the north, but essentially that's the dynamics. It's about, um, uh, it, it was in the original Pueblo of the city of Los Angeles. Indiana Street has never changed as a, as a uh, uh, eastern border of the city of Los Angeles, uh, but uh, the north and south dimensions sometimes of Boyle Heights have, have been seen as differently because of uh, freeways and other kinds of construction. Now, I live outside of Boyle Heights now, though Libro Schmibros is still thriving after 10 years. Um, ever since I first got to Boyle Heights in 2010, I've been hearing that Professor George Sanchez is working on a book about Boyle Heights. What was the genesis of the project? And I guess, how has it evolved over, and you'll have to tell us how many years, and how has Boyle Heights evolved since you first started writing about it? Um, so I, it's, I, I like to think of this project as about a 30 year project, about three decades. And uh, ever since the last book was done, I've been thinking about this. I've had a variety of titles at, at USC and administrative titles. That's one of the delays. But the other was that I really wanted to spend the time to essentially build an archive of Boyle Heights. And so that started with work with the Japanese American National Museum and an exhibition that they did on the history of Boyle Heights in, the, in 20, uh, 2001, 2002, um, where we, uh, I headed up a research team that interviewed lots of people who were still alive at that point, who had grown up in Boyle Heights, mostly in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, went on to do some work with the Jewish Historical Society and, and their preservation of the Breed Street Synagogue on Breed Street. Uh, that informed a lot of my work and then started to do work uh, in the community uh, to tell the history in a variety of different formats. I did uh, something called History in a Box, which was to help Boyle Heights teachers teach the history of the multiple groups in Boyle Heights when they teach California history in fourth grade. And that was very successful. And then since uh, 2016, I've been working with Josefina Lopez on a Boyle Heights museum in which we tell uh, the history of Boyle Heights to people who live in Boyle Heights. Boyle Heights has always been a place for newcomers, people who've just arrived. And so they don't necessarily know that this history and so we've done exhibitions on Mexican repatriation of the 1930s, on uh, the 1968 student walkouts, on the history of Edward Roybal as the first Mexican American on the city council, and then one that we're finishing now that will be uh, going up in the next few weeks on entrepreneurship in Boyle Heights and the history of businesses uh, in Boyle Heights. So uh, this is all an attempt to kind of take this history that we're learning and take it right to the people who live in Boyle Heights uh, those have been very successful. We've partnered with Casa 0101, the theater that Josefina Lopez uh, founded, uh, to, to have these ex exhibitions there. And um, that's all informed, essentially, this book as we've gone on uh, uh, over time. Yeah, they've been absolutely beautiful. And uh, I encourage everybody within the sound of my voice, certainly to take in a show there. But uh, beforehand and after, if they're not doing intermissions these days, uh, by all means, check it out. So think back to the interviews um, you've created. Um, who, what interviewees do you remember most fondly? Um, there were one of the ones that is very powerful from the Japanese American Museum, and I used a lot to, in my chapters, is, a, is an interview with uh, Leo Frumkin, who, uh, whose parents uh, moved into Boyle Heights in the, in the uh, teens, 20s, 
Um, and uh, he was quite a, a radical uh, in Boyle Heights as he went through the school system, as he ran for student body president at Roosevelt, as he became a very young leader in a union uh, out of Boyle Heights. Um, he's very memorable because he, rem he remembers Boyle Heights in a very vivid way as a place of uh, a thriving kind of leftist community that was, all, was internationalist, that, that basically saw itself uh, Boyle Heights being part of a world community and very explicit about that. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Paula Crisostomo, who was one of the student body leaders at Lincoln High School. Um, and she uh, lived in Boyle Heights and uh, was a, a big leader in the uh, East LA blowouts of 1968. And she um, really told, told vividly what it was like to grow up uh, in, in schooling in Boyle Heights and uh, really not get the kind of education that other folks had gotten and wh why the students, uh, she was 17 at the time, led a walkout of, of high schools all over East Los Angeles in 1968 that sort of started uh, the Chicano movement. Um, there was, of course, Molly Wilson, uh, a wonderful woman who, uh, African-American, uh, who grew up in Boyle Heights. Her parents had moved there. Um, and she tells the very vivid story of um, really being shocked when her four best friends, all Japanese Americans, were uh, taken away by, the, by our government and put in concentration camps, uh, in, in internment camps, uh, in uh, World War II. Uh, as a 14-year-old, she was upset that her four best friends were not going to be with her in high school. And her personal protest was to write them every week. And so those letters came back. And I, I first encountered her when we were doing some work for the uh, Japanese American Museum exhibition. And she literally walked into the room with grocery bags full of letters. And these were the return letters from her Japanese American friends that she had kept for 50 years in her closet and wanted to turn them over. They now exist at the Japanese American National Museum as a reflection of what internment life was like for those, uh, those friends of hers. Um, these, are, these are incredibly important figures that you don't generally get in uh, US history. They're, they're uh, common people, they're, they're people who grew up, uh, tell you the vivid histories from different angles in Boyle Heights, but it's really in their interactions with other people and their perspectives that I really grew to, to love the, the stories I would hear from individuals. I have to thank you personally because uh, the, the book I wrote a couple of years ago, Dear Los Angeles, has some letters from Molly's friend Sandy uh, written to her from Santa Anita. And now that I'm working on Dear California, you, you, George, have to call to my attention any letters and diaries from Boyle Heights I'm going to overlook, especially Molly's, which I, I didn't include. Um, I've got something that I've always wondered about, and I bet you can dispatch the question in, in a minute, which is... Uh, when people first got to Los Angeles, whether it was from Mexico or from the Lower East Side of Manhattan or, uh, you know, political refugees from Italy, um, you know, African Americans from the South, how did they find Boyle Heights? I mean, I guess, you know, maybe relatives had written to them beforehand, but literally, you know, did they arrive at Union Station and start walking east? Did they come ashore in San Pedro and start walking north? I know that, and we should probably say, restrictive covenants didn't allow them to live many other places in Los Angeles, but how did they first make their way to Boyle Heights? Well, um, Union Station was the most uh, active in the early 20th century of a place that uh, welcomed newcomers. Um, one of the most interesting ways in which they got to know about Boyle Heights was, was from African-American porters that worked the trains. Mm -hmm. And what Boyle Heights is one of the places that they lived in, uh, in mass because it was one of the few places African-Americans could live um, in Los Angeles, in addition to South LA, but Boyle Heights was a little closer to Union Station. And so I, I assume that lots of people heard about this place from the porters. Uh, uh, in addition, in some of the communities, certainly the Jewish community, uh, some of the Mexican community, uh, you weren't coming basically alone. You were coming because a, a relative, a rabbi, somebody else had told you 
about this place that was uh, bringing a community together. And that was Boyle Heights. And, and you know, whether if you were Jewish, it was you'd find a lot of Jews there. You'd find uh, stores there. If you were Mexican, there were various kind of connections. So there was a lot of people guiding folks to Boyle Heights. Of course, if you tried to go into other communities, you were, you were often told you can't live here because of restrictive covenants. So basically turning, turning east um, was very common from Union Station. The other thing is the nature of the jobs that people got. So if you were working class and you came into to, uh, Union Station and you wanted to work in the garment industry or you wanted to work uh, in, the, in the Japanese community or, you, you know, Boyle Heights was a very convenient location for that kind of work, particularly with the streetcars at the time going from across the, the bridges uh, over the river um, back and forth to Boyle Heights. So that uh, it often had to do with find, you know, where you wanted to work and Boyle Heights being a convenient location for, for that. Got it. And uh, I, I should just mention, um, we'll be doing questions for at least the last 10 minutes of this conversation when I will very reluctantly relinquish the my interlocutor role. So anytime people want to toss a, a, a question or two into the Q&A uh, window of Zoom, um, by all means, uh, feel free. Uh, I hope you do. Um, uh, just a flashback for a second, Boyle Heights is named after a guy who died 150 years ago um, this year. Is that possible? Uh, no, I guess that couldn't be. Uh, um, well, he was either born or died, and I'm not going to belabor <laughs> the question by looking it up. Tell us a little bit about Andrew Boyle now that I've, now that I've uh, um, uh, misdated him. Um, Andrew Boyle was an uh, immigrant from Ireland who had done a lot of different things in the West before he got to Los Angeles. He had actually um, uh, fought in the, uh, the Texas Revolution and then had fought in the Mexican-American War uh, on the US side um, and uh, eventually made his way to California where one of his friends that he had fought with said, he was up in San Francisco, you ought to come down to Los Angeles. There's lots of land, this is a good time to come. So he ends up in Boyle Heights right after California has become a state. And he ends up buying property um, uh, right in the flats and above in the Heights area. So right in that area, uh, right along what is now Boyle Avenue. Um, it, it, it's incredibly convenient for him to be there. There's almost no one living on that side. He constantly tries to, uh, uh, push the city to to bring water, running water to to Boyle Heights irrigation, improve his land. Uh, he he uh, he's not he, he isn't successful, uh, but uh, he does end up um, marrying his his daughter to uh, a Hollenbeck, and uh, this is then uh, his his son-in-law will uh, become a mayor of of Los Angeles. And uh, after his, his uh, after Andrew Boyle passes away, he will name Boyle Heights after his uh, father-in-law. Uh, and they will, they will uh, build then what, what is more of an urban uh, quality to Boyle Heights with bridges over the LA River, water irrigation coming to, the, to that side. And eventually uh, it'll become more of what, what they envisioned was suburban homes. Um, so that's that's the that's the nature of the of the uh, the transition of Andrew Boyle. It's one of the ways that the Irish became white in California uh, uh, is kind of taking advantage of this transition of conquest. Got it. Um, well, I, 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 it's apparent now that he died in 1871. So just to clarify that, and I hope he was a wonderful man in or, uh, so that he can deserve to have such a, a remarkable place named after him. Speaking of names, um, when a lot of people look back on Boyle Heights, older folks, uh, one thing that they remember with great fondness is their high school years at Roosevelt as Rough Riders. Um, I don't want to start any kind of kerfuffle about the name of Roosevelt and you know how San Francisco uh, is is you know renaming or wanting to rename or was until recently wanting to rename a lot of schools. But 
Roosevelt, uh, of course, was a mixed bag. Um, you know, he was an anti-corporate crusader. He was also an imperialist. So you take the good with the bad, I suppose. But um, here's my ambush question. If you could rename Roosevelt High School after any uh, person who lived in Boyle Heights, who would that be? Uh, you know, certainly for me, it would be Edward Roybal. Really? I think he's probably the, the most significant person um, for the longest period of time that contributed to Boyle Heights history. I think he, he really uh, brought Boyle Heights into the city of Los Angeles and uh, he embodies so much of the, uh, of the um, empowerment that both uh, Mexicans and Jews wanted to see in Boyle Heights. Um, together through the community service organization, they really formed that organization, brought him into power in 1949 and, and, and serving in 1949 to 1963 in the city council, he was really often the lone voice um, on the left uh, in that very anti-communist period to really speak for the people of Boyle Heights. And I think he, uh, as we go forward in time, his, his importance is starting to really shine even, even brighter uh, as a really a politician that that mattered to this to that neighborhood um, and that brought it, uh, you know, that that served it well, even in the, the hardest of times. After 10, 11 years in Boyle Heights, I learned so much from your book, including shamefully more detail than I ever had before about the reparations, sorry, <laughs> the the repatriation years. I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. And uh, when the Great Depression hit, um, city leaders in Los Angeles were struggling because very quickly, one third of all the people in Los Angeles were out of, out of work. And one of the groups they targeted were uh, Mexican immigrants and their children. Um, and uh, they ended up um, both encouraging the federal government to come in and try to deport people, but they really didn't have the setup to that. So they ended up moving towards repatriation, which was in many ways a local government effort, particularly from the county, to try to pay people, give people a ticket, a one-way ticket back to Mexico, uh, instead of taking care of their, their needs. Um, now, in this period, uh, it turns out that a very high percentage of the people that were sent back were US born citizens, children in those families. Maybe as many as two thirds of the people that were repatriated had never been to Mexico. They were born here, but they ended up uh, being sent back to Mexico in the 1930s. So between 1931 and 1934, um, LA County sponsored trains that would take people back to Mexico. Some of those individuals, those children would end up growing up and then trying to come back uh, in, the war, in World War II and, and afterwards. Uh, it, it's really the, the greatest um, movement of trying to push people out of the United States and repatriation that the United States had seen up to that point. Uh, it ended up uh, moving about one third of all the Mexican origin people in the United States back. LA was at the forefront of that. Um, and many people see it as the first of many attempts, including till today, of, of uh, basically deportations and, and uh, attempts to push people out of this country who they think don't belong here. Yeah, uh, repatriation is a nicer word for deportation, but it's, it's hard to tell the difference historically. Uh, as I was reading your book, I couldn't help wondering, you know, Roosevelt High School was so, I, as I understand it, worthy of the people of, of the affection of so many people who, who remember it fondly. Um, Certainly, you know, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I wonder. We talk about the intermingling of the different ethnicities at Roosevelt High. Did this intermingling ever proceed to intermarriage, or at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, something a little a little friendlier than uh, than prom dates? Um, a lot less than one would think. <laughs> um, uh, very consistently, people talked about the boundaries that they kept mm -hmm. uh, as they grew up. And uh, particularly in the 30s and 40s, there was some interracial dating. There was some, um, uh, you know, but there was also a lot of uh, boundaries uh, that kept people from dating. What there was a lot of is friendships 
uh, of women with women, men with men, people playing together, but a lot less uh, intermarriage than one would think until you move fairly late into the game, into the 50s and 60s. And then you begin to see some of that. One of the best stories I, I have is when I started the work uh, three decades ago, I taught my first seminar at UCLA um, that was uh, uh, really a, a very awkward attempt by, bring, by recruiting students that were part of the Chicano student organization, Mecha, the Jewish Student Union, and the Japanese American uh, student organization together and having them all interview people. And one of the people in that class was a, a Jewish young woman who was part Latina who grew up in Orange County and wanted to interview her parents because it turns out her father was Mexican, her mother had grown up Jewish uh, and they had dated and then eventually married, being disowned by the way, by both families. Um, <laughs> this was in Orange County? This was in Orange County. She lived, now is living in Orange County, but at that time they had grown up in Boyle Heights, different parts of Boyle Heights. And it was the first time she had ever asked her parents about their separate backgrounds. And so she interviewed them separately. It was a great interview. Oh. And one of the stories that was told by her father, who did not grow up Jewish, um, was that he grew up in a block that used to be Jewish, but now had only one Jewish family left. And as he was attending Hollenbeck Junior High, um, the Jewish father in that family came over to him because he was a pretty big guy. And he said, look, I need you to take care of my son when he goes to Hollenbeck. I will pay you to protect him. And so this is the late 50s, early 60s. He basically is paying this kid to, to, who is bigger than most middle school students to protect his, his, his own child. And out of all this came a kind of interest in Jewish uh, culture and Jewish life, which led then in high school for him to date what would become his his uh, his mother, uh, his his wife, excuse me, and uh, and so it's just a fascinating story uh, that was uncovered by their daughter, who didn't know any of this history, had grown up as a Jewish kid in Orange County with a Spanish last name. So um, anyway, I just thought that was a great way. Uh, one of the few examples I have of both an intermarriage, but one that points to the differences uh, in growing up. That's tremendous. Um, if people want to, uh, are, they, are the files, is the exhibit still in a closet at the Japanese American Museum where people can consult them? Oh, they're still, they're still there and they're in the library. Uh, they can see those, those uh, interviews, absolutely. They're all there. I'll be first in line. Um, I should ask, um, present company accepted, not many Jews in Boyle Heights at the moment. Um, where did they all go? Probably some of our Skirball listeners are, are especially curious about that. Well, beginning in World War II, of course, World War II disrupts lots of things. And part of what you see is uh, a, a tremendous amount of participation in the war effort by young people in Boyle Heights. So they're often uh, leaving Boyle Heights for the first time to serve in the army or married to servicemen going to other places. Um, so beginning in the war and then after the war, other places open up. And th this is one of the key parts of my book is as uh, places that had traditionally not been open for Jews do open up in Los Angeles. The west side of Los Angeles, uh, the San Fernando Valley opens up in a way uh, in the wake of World War II, uh, which basically gives Jews an option to move out. At the same time, there are now uh, redlining practices where, where essentially Boyle Heights is seen as a particularly risky place for a bank to invest a mortgage. And it's redlined, literally it's put in red so that for a young couple that wants to start a family, it was often cheaper to buy a home in a new development in the San Fernando Valley than to try to purchase a home in Boyle Heights. So you get a lot of people leaving because of that. It's hard to, to buy something in Boyle Heights. It's hard to start a family. Boyle Heights is very overcrowded in the wake of the war. So you get a lot of movement of Jews out. The Jews that stay in Boyle Heights tend to be more to the left, more radical in their politics. And this is a time after the war that really the anti-communism of most Los Angeles communities really rises. So that Boyle Heights then becomes, the Jews that are left in Boyle Heights tend to be uh, 
more socialist or communist, leftists of various sorts that organize to try to um, protect the community in the wake of all this. And so that's, those are the Jews that tend to stay the longest uh, into the 50s and into the early 60s. Um, so really things change. And of course, the Jewish community becomes much more suburban, um, uh, essentially is accepted into white society in a different way. Um, and and uh, that changes the relationship between the Jewish community and other communities in Los Angeles. Yeah, when I first part started spending time in Boyle Heights, uh, my family would tell me that, oh yeah, Boyle Heights used to be 100% Jewish. Um, of course, I hope people don't need to consult your book to know that Boyle Heights was never 100% anything, um, right. maybe 40% Jewish. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, you, you've laid out very, fairly well the reasons why the Jews left. Um, African Americans weren't any more welcome in other parts of town <laughs> than they had been before. Why did they go too? Um, part of what occurred in the redlining in the post-World War II era is that um, racial mixture began to de uh, be defined as something that was risky. Yeah. So even if it was black Mexican mixture, that was seen as risky. Mm -hmm. So the one place that did occur in Boyle Heights was in the public housing, in which you, you did have more African Americans coming into Boyle Heights to take advantage of low income housing, uh, as at the same time that you had Mexican immigrants uh, in those same places in Aliso Village and Ramona Gardens, in those places, but that outside of public housing, um, basically the areas of South Central Los Angeles that were also very racially mixed before the war became more and more African-American. So by the time you hit 65 and 70, South LA is overwhelmingly African-American, East LA is overwhelmingly Latino, particularly Mexican-American. And that's something that is government inspired because racial mixture is part of what defines um, a risky thing. The, the 1939 uh, Federal Housing Authority uh, calls Boyle Heights hopelessly heterogeneous <laughs> with diverse and subversive racial elements throughout. So it, and it assigns it a red designation because of that. Yes, and if I'm remembering correctly, um, which for a change I think I am because I've been doing a lot of work with the Federal Writers Project lately, trying to get it started again, and I should put people on notice if they think that's a good idea, um, by all means get behind uh, Congressman Ted Lieu's uh, House Resolution 3054, the 21st Century Federal Writers Project Act. Um, if I remember correctly, the WPA Guide to Los Angeles refers to Boyle Heights as a neighborhood teeming with Jews and Mexicans. Right, exactly. Um, you know a thing about that, don't you? Didn't you, do I have this, if I totally imagined that you helped catalog the WPA files at UCLA? I helped uh, to book one to find them mm -hmm. in search for my first book. Um, I had heard that the that the original documents of the WPA were at UCLA and they had to search. No one had asked for them before. Uh, this was in the uh, 80s. And uh, we identified them, we found them, they took them out and they'd never been opened since they were quickly thrown in. And so as, it, as I went through them, I gave them their very first uh, guide, uh, would keep track of it on my, my little computer and, and then gave them a guide at the end so that other people could have uh, more access, but it was uh, pretty amazing to see them in the original uh, boxes that they had been <laughs> they had been put into uh, well, storage. You did a great service to posterity. I'm teaching a WPA syllabus at UCLA, and I, I want to get them digitized. That's how that's how invaluable they are. Fantastic. Um, just to talk about current events for a second, I noticed that one of the priorities of the Biden administration, one of umpteen priorities, seems to be. Um, undoing some of the damage done in communities like Boyle Heights that were carved up by freeways. Does any community in the country have more freeways running through it than Boyle Heights? Uh, it's pretty tough. Uh, maybe some places in St. Louis that I know has, have been carved up quite a bit, um, uh, you know, some other folks, but Boyle Heights, you know, essentially has five freeways that are built through it from 1945 to 1965. Um, and built through it uh, in literal form. So I, I, I 
like to show people the Second Street School, where there is a freeway that is literally right next to where the kids play. And that means that uh, the rates of asthma in Boyle Heights are very high. It also is the freeway that goes through the Hollenbeck Park. Um, you know, what city would allow a freeway to literally be built through a park that is in constant use by a population? And so um, that's, you know, uh, what was protected when they built those freeways were some businesses um, very carefully avoiding the Sears Tower, for example. It actually curves, so it's not there. So, but 15% but of all the land in Boyle Heights is taken up by freeways, nothing bigger than the East LA interchange. Um, and Ed Roybal, when he's in city council, tries to fight this, but, but it's set up through the California Department of Transportation, which is basically made um, uh, impermeable to local efforts. And so the best he can do is to try to get people fair compensation for the houses that were taken by eminent domain. And then eventually people actually have to fight for on and off ramps in Boyle Heights because they weren't built for Boyle Heights. The freeways were built for suburban commuters to come into downtown. So if the businesses wanted any of that traffic, they, they had to get a, an on and off ramp. So you, you, <laughs> those are late additions to the freeways. Um, so it's amazing to watch the, the battles over the freeways because it really does, of course, make Boyle Heights a more difficult place to live. You have communities that are carved out by freeways, you, you have air pollution, you've got all kinds of um, things that, that are negative that result from, from the freeways. Just amazing. They will route a freeway around Sears, but they'll run it through a park. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. I mean, you know, growing up as a as an idiot kid on the West Side, I you know heard about Boyle Heights uh, on traffic bulletins basically because of all those freeways. Um, how would you say the popular image of Boyle Heights has evolved over the years? Uh, not just you know the the you know ridiculousness mentioned in the otherwise pristine WPA guides, but also you know LA Times coverage. Um, and then, you know, to the point, and then nowadays things have changed so much. You've got two dueling cable streaming television series set in Boyle Heights. And in fact, I believe Channel 7 is recording our conversation tonight in hopes of using at least a snippet of it. So what would you say? And of course, there's homegrown reporting on Boyle Heights. There's wonderful newspapers like Boyle Heights Beat. And, uh, and Brooklyn and Boyle, which is indirectly how I got to Boyle Heights years ago. Um, what would you say about how the image of Boyle Heights in, in the popular imagination has evolved over the years? Um, you know, of course, because of the news, uh, because of uh, incredible disparities, um, you had Boyle Heights really seen for a long time, particularly in the 80s and 90s, as a place of gangs, a place of drug dealers, very negative imagery. Um, and that was almost all that, that people would see on the news. And it became something that got played out in movies um, and, and other kinds of popular media that that was, you know, and of course it's the same time that all the up and coming Latino actors, that's all they could get in Hollywood is those kinds of images, right? Um, and I think, you know, what's occurred and, and what's interesting to me is, is, is of course in our current moment, where all these places are being gentrified, both of the, the TV shows that now feature Boyle Heights are about gentrification of various sorts yeah. and uh, about the possibilities of change. Of course, Boyle Heights has always changed. It's always been changing. Um, but I think the key for me is whether Boyle Heights can remain a place that low-income people can still live in, that newcomers to the city can still f uh, feel at home. And whether it will attain that even as it increases uh, people who are more middle income coming back to Boyle Heights, that to me is the key. So the policies about low income housing, the policies trying to get, right now it's about 75% renters, trying to get people who, are, who live there, who own homes, uh, less absentee landlords, um, all that's going to improve, I think, the quality of life in Boyle Heights. But it, there's got to be policies that promote low income housing and also that retain the cultural richness of Boyle Heights. Um, I worry about a, a mariachi plaza, for example, that may not have any mariachis living around it. Yeah. And that to me would be a disgrace 
for what we value in Los Angeles. I, I want us to look at cultural policies that keep uh, subsidies for cultural uh, actors like uh, mariachi musicians. Um, if we're gonna take their name, if we're gonna take their culture, we ought to make sure that they can still live in the city uh, that, that names things after them. I'm glad we're getting a chance to discuss this. There's been at least one question about it in, in the Q&A uh, window, which um, will be uh, the source of our questions in just a few minutes. But um, I'm, I'm loving this too much not to, not to want to shoehorn a few of mine in still. Um, the, the subtitle of your terrific book from University of California Press, which I encourage everybody uh, to, to, to go right out and get two copies of, um, is how a Los Angeles neighborhood became the future of American democracy. Now, when you say that, um, is the Boyle Heights, is, is the, is the, are you referring to the multiracial Boyle Heights of the 1930s and, uh, and adjacent decades, or are you referring to um, contemporary Boyle Heights, or in some way, are you referring to them both? I'm referring to them both. I think it's incredibly important to learn from the history, but also the present situation of a community like Boyle Heights. Um, you know, we're under a, a crisis of democracy right now. And though we always focus on Washington or Sacramento, and we think about that, we, we need to start thinking about neighborhoods. How do you make sure that we have neighborhoods where people feel invested in working together across differences to improve the neighborhood? And you see that throughout Boyle Heights history. Uh, you know, we've talked about some of the, the, the ethnic organizations, the labor unions, the, the, the groups that kind of empowered local citizens to take action like the community service organization in the past. Um, but I'm also interested, for example, in Mothers of East LA, in Homeboy Industries, in the organizations of the present that really uh, brought in, for example, undocumented residents uh, into a political force that to protect the neighborhood that didn't focus on citizenship, but focused on motherhood or focused on being a resident that cared about his or her neighborhood. Um, and to me, you know, with 11 million people who are undocumented in this country, so much of Los Angeles uh, having this status or growing up in mixed ass families, we have to talk about how do we recreate democracy uh, in these neighborhoods. Uh, these people care about the neighborhood they live in, they wanna take action, they cannot vote, so we have to talk about non-electoral democracy. What does it mean to, to speak up uh, in those situations? And, and these organizations have incorporated that into the politics that pra they practice. So I think there's a lot to be learned from Boyle Heights, both in the present, but also in the past, that I think can, can engender a new kind of politics that's community-based in this country. We're gonna need that if we're gonna move forward in a, in a democratic fashion. I think we've lost parts of that in our community. So many of the people that used to live in Boyle Heights say, say, I remember that Boyle Heights. I remember when I knew my neighbors. I remember when I uh, gathered with other folks. Now, and wh wherever I'm living, I don't, rem I don't know my neighbors. I haven't seen them, right? Even before the pandemic, I hadn't seen them. So I think it's so important to, to resurrect a community that works. And Boyle Heights certainly has worked in that way uh, for most of its history. Um, I'm due to open this up with, and it's bittersweet, to, to public uh, questions in a moment. Um, matter of fact, why don't I do it now? Um, there's a question about, um, about Philip's music store uh, as a story of intercommunal cooperation. You want to tell us a little bit about the Phillipses? Sure. Um, Bill Phillips, William Phillips, um, was a jazz musician uh, coming out of uh, the Army uh, during the 1930s, and he started a music store in Boyle Heights in 1937. Uh, there were several music stores, but he stuck around. He stuck around with his music store until the early 90s, um, and he um, lived in Boyle Heights, uh, actually in City Terrace, um, for a good part of that, but even when he moved his family to the west side, he kept the store. One of the real lessons, Bill Phillips ended up being very heavily involved in the Michigan Soto uh, Jewish Community Center. He was on the board, but at the very same time, he realized that he had to adapt the store to the community. Many of the, um, the Mexican-American musicians that come out of Boyle Heights, particularly out of Roosevelt, credit Bill Phillips for talking to them when, he, when, he, when they came as young people into their music store. People like Los Lobos, people 
who ended up coming out of Boyle Heights because he would take them aside and say, hey, you know, I know that there's the houses around here. People don't like to let you practice. I have some practice rooms in the back. Would you like to play your trumpet there or your drum set there? Uh, he would nurture young musicians and he had connections to the world of music in Los Angeles. He set some of his early folks up with Count Basie, with, with um, other uh, 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 big bands in that era. And then he would connect people. A lot of folks credit him in a very quiet way for doing that. Now, why, you know, how did I get to know this history? Well, his son, who grew up on the West Side, would be Bruce Phillips, who's right now the leading Jewish demographer of Los Angeles, sociologist at Hebrew Union College. Um, this is a story that we piece together both from the family, but even more importantly from, from the musicians. A uh, wonderful book by Anthony Macias, Mexican American Mojo, that traces the musical side is all was also looking at this and he uh, you know so this is a wonderful story of someone who even when he physically moved his family to the west side kept the music store there and adapted to the neighborhood over time um and it didn't sell out until the 90s essentially so um i think it's a great story he, he ended up helping so many musicians over a very long period of time and at the same time uh, kept his Jewish identity, uh, kept uh, activity in the in the uh, Soto Michigan Center. Um, anyway, it's a it's a great it's a great story that came at me from lots of different places. I, I bet I, I I the one thing people always tell me is that he never asked anybody to leave. Um, is so inspiring. Um, let me reiterate, as we ask the last couple of questions, that uh, the book can be purchased via, via a link that's in the chat room right now. Um, there's also a, a question here, a fairly sophisticated question. I, I hope I can do justice to if I paraphrase it. Um, how do you think State Bill 10 and the other density bills coming out of Sacramento will change the character of Boyle Heights? And then we could just sort of enlarge that, if you like, into a conversation about um, what people who don't live in Boyle Heights or live there anymore, but want the best for it, um, can do? Should they come visit? Uh, you know, is there anything that, uh, that, that they might do to feel uh, part of the solution if there is indeed a problem to be solved? Well, one of the solutions for Boyle Heights is to make high density uh, living available all over Los Angeles. <laughs> um, so it's not a Boyle Heights solution, it's what will solve things in Boyle Heights and the housing pressure there and in so many other neighborhoods. Because so much of Los Angeles is, um, I think, unjustly uh, zoned only for single family homes. As we improve our public transportation uh, the, you know, around the subways, around, we have to have a denser living space. We have to provide more housing. Right now, if you grow up in West LA, it's very unlikely you will be able to afford to live in the same place you grew up in. And therefore, what happens? Well, you start looking at other neighborhoods. You start going to Boyle Heights. You start being part of the gentrification as opposed to trying to change the policy of where you grew up. And I think therefore, the reason I'm for those bills is because we have to have denser housing everywhere. This isn't just for the elite. It's, it's gotta be everywhere and that reduces the pressures in low income areas to sort of serve also for the needs, the housing needs of, of the, the, the elite, but, but younger population that came out of those, those families. And I think that's got to really change in Los Angeles if we're going to be able to meet the needs. So the Boyle Heights solution is not just from in Boyle Heights. It actually is, has to be a, a citywide, a statewide approach to building more housing. At the very same time, we have to have low income housing built into new developments like what's going up in at the Sears Tower. We have to protect other areas um, for, for that housing. Boyle Heights, what happened to it uh, and why it's become so much renter identified is because single family homes were divided up so that four families could live there. So you got that all over Boyle Heights and you would want some, some movement back into single family homes in Boyle Heights, right? but you're gonna have denser around all of the subway stops, that's normal, but it should be normal everywhere, right? If you see what's happening on the west side, you get some of that, but for a long time, the west side 
uh, fought against subways, fought against public transportation. It's clear that we have to change that attitude. Um, and you know, this, these are citywide and statewide problems that have to be addressed. Yeah, in a sense, it occurs to me uh, elsewhere in the city, you've got the equivalent of that. You're not divvying up apart, divvying up homes into apartments, but you're encouraging alternative dwelling units in, or granny flats in people's backyards. So you're divvying up at least the lots, the properties. That's right. um, okay, these questions are getting so good, and there's so many of them. I hope people can preserve them, can copy them um, before before our conversation winks out. Um, many people seem to uh, wish, as I understand, that they had been from Boyle Heights, but unfortunately, they're so close. They grew up in City Terrace. They grew up in Lincoln Heights. Um, I wonder if you'd uh, mention those two places and the likelihood that we'll get a sequel from you or anybody else about, uh, you know, the, the, the wonderful saga of, um, of the adjacent uh, lovely neighborhoods. You'll see that all those areas play a part in this. Um, and it's mostly because of Roosevelt. Roosevelt sometimes reached in and certainly grabbed people from City Terrace, sometimes Lincoln Heights, sometimes Belvedere. Um, and so that's sort of part. I, I, I find this area to be <clears throat> really important uh, as a general area and, and the particular histories I'm interested in. I'm interested in um, the relationship between Italians and Mexicans in Lincoln Heights. That really? certainly uh, deserves a book and the more current population increasingly of Chinese Americans. Um, Belvedere was always heavily Mexican and that's right across Indiana Street. It was always more Mexican than Boyle Heights until very recently. So that deserves, I think, its own concentration uh, a focus on East Los Angeles uh, outside of the, the city. Um, city Terrace, I think of, is so connected to Boyle Heights and to the rest of the area. I, I know that lots of people are interested in that. So these are all important neighborhoods. Um, you know, I think Boyle Heights has a richness partly because of Roosevelt and the memories of people that went there. And so sometimes that spills out in lots of different ways. Okay, let me issue a blanket apology to the questioners in the Q&A room whose questions I didn't get to. They're all fascinating. Um, and I hope the answers come to you somehow. Um, please keep asking them. That just goes uh, generally for everybody. Um, you've certainly resolved some fascinating questions over the years and, and left others for, for future research and conversation. Um, let me ask you, it's been 30 years. You knocked this one off. What are you gonna, what are you gonna bang out next? Um, well, I'm working on a of bringing together of some essays that mostly are about contemporary Los Angeles. I'm interested in this period that where we went from uh, Latinos being uh, a large minority to basically the majority of the region. Uh, what does that mean for Los Angeles? What does it mean in its, in its history? So I'm, I, I have a series of essays that I've been, some of which have been published, most of which have not been published that I'm putting together now in a book. Can't wait. So how does it feel to have it done after 30 years? It's great. It's wonderful. <laughs> I owed it to the people of Boyle Heights. Well, on behalf of your readers, present and future, thank you, George. Thank you, Professor Sanchez. And um, by all means, grab his book with both hands uh, at the link in the chat room. And uh, being held up now by the lovely Isabel Rosenthal, who probably <laughs> deserves the last word. Oh, thank you, David. Thank you, George and David for this really enlightening and informative conversation. Um, thank you to our audience for tuning in tonight. I'm thrilled to say that the scoreball is open and um, we have our Ai Weiwei exhibit. Um, we have for families, our Noah's Ark Outdoor Explorers. We have some live music coming at the tail end of the summer. So please, um, I encourage you to check out our website at scoreball.org um, and please, read this great book. I've learned so much from it, from the book, from our conversation tonight. And um, really on behalf of the Skirball, thank you to George and David. Um, thank you to our audience and um, good night, everybody. <laughs>